David, thank you very much for joining us to talk about the Rivian R1T and the future of four-wheel driving. Now, before we get into that, I just want to go over some of your background. I've read a bit about your bio on Jalopnik. You own three or maybe four four-wheel drives, all of which are manual. So tell us about what sort of off-roading you've done, what's, what you enjoy doing, and your background as a car journalist. Yeah, I became a car journalist because of in large part because of my love for four wheel drives. I, I started driving off road when I was like 15, 16. Um, I was living with my family in Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, my dad was in the army on Fort Leavenworth. And there's this, uh, you'll probably be surprised to hear this. You know, if you, if you, I know a lot of your audience is from the U S there's not a lot to do in certain parts of Kansas. Okay. Um, it's rural. There's, you know, and I have five brothers. So you got six boys, in Kansas, not a lot going on. And our, our, our vehicle was a first generation Jeep Grand Cherokee, the, Z, the ZJ, as you'd call it. So solid axles, four liter straight six. Um, we off-roaded the crap out of that vehicle. Um, on the Missouri River, River floodplain, down by this airfield on base, yeah. this big floodplain that just turns to slop all the time. Um, and we would just, just beat on this old Jeep. And I, it was impossible as a young, you know, as a young teenager, not to just fall in love with this machine. Mm. Here's this thing that just, it's a tank. That engine just never died. The, you know, the, the, the vehicle was built, you know, pretty sturdily. I mean, solid axles and, you know, yes, it's unibody, but it was yeah. stout. It would take anything. Um, and so at that point I was like, you know what, one day I want to work at Jeep. That's, that's my goal. I want to at some point work at Jeep. So I studied engineering um, and just really annoyed as many people as I could until I scored a job as an engineer at Chrysler in, in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and yeah, I worked on the Jeep Wrangler JL program as a cooling system lead, um, which was a dream because like here's a kind of the, the ultimate off-road vehicle and I can play a, a, you know, a small part in its development. Um, and as for vehicles that I own, I own, I think, like nine Jeeps right now. Um, I've got, you know, a couple of Ford Control, uh, Willys uh, FC oh, yeah. Jeep, an FC 150 and an FC 170. I've got a um, 100 Series uh, Lexus, which I'm not as big a fan of as my old Jeeps, I have to say. As great as it is, as stout as it is. I know I just made a lot of enemies just now. Um Let's see, I've got a couple of Cherokee XJs, which I yeah. absolutely love. I have a, J, a Jeep J10 pickup, you know, the pickup version of the, of the wagon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, and then I've got a, a Jeep Cherokee Golden Eagle, an old one, a 79, so the full size one. Um, and my current favorite, which is kind of a little bit of an oddball, is uh, I've got three, well, two and a half ZJ Grand Cherokee, so like my first vehicle but with a five-speed manual stick shift. So kind of, they only made about 1,500. They're super rare. And I, for some reason, I just can't stop acquiring okay. them. That's fantastic. Okay. So yeah, you're, de you're definitely an enthusiast and a forward, forward driver, which is exactly um, what we want to hear. So let's talk about the Rivian R1T then. And you got to drive it, and I believe the world first press event for it. Just give us an overview of what went on in that press event. How many days of it? What sort of terrain did you cover? How much time oh, did yeah. you get behind the wheel? Give us the context there. Yeah. So Rivian invited a bunch of um bunch of journalists to Colorado to Breckenridge um, and it was you know these press events they're oftentimes they're 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 similar in many ways they're you know too fancy and they're you know mm. involve a lot of involve a lot of you know marketing and PR people yeah. but Rivian did things a bit differently I have to say um, I, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about the event itself because these you know but Lots of engineers. I actually think there were more engineers there than there were journalists. It was wow. Um, it was just a. And it was very low key in a cabin. We just had you know food around a campfire, and it was just a bunch of you know Rivian engineers and designers hanging out with some journalists interspersed and just chatting about this vehicle. And it gave me a chance to really 
really discuss anything I wanted to discuss with with their engineers who were very open. But you have to say it's not the case for for every company. Oftentimes, I'll totally. speak with a with a manufacturer and I'll say, "Hey, um, you know, an example, you know, was Ford, for example, when their Mach E came out, I asked some of their engineers about um, their battery technology, and they 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 didn't feel comfortable responding because it wasn't part of the messages that they were told to, to sort of uh, um, communicate. Um, but, you know, with, you know, that's not the case for all of them. You know, um, Volkswagen is generally good about it. And Rivian, it's the same way. Um, they were so open that they would discuss compromises with me, which is, that's how engineering works. Engineering is a game of compromises, um, but it doesn't look pretty. Uh, you know, automakers are often so, so afraid to hear, you know, that, that journalists, they're just going to say the negative side of the compromise made that they won't even talk about the compromise at all. And then you don't really have the story of, of how the vehicle got developed, but they were very open. They talked with me about the four wheel drive system. Um, and the impression I got about Rivian is that at least the folks at the, at this event, true enthusiasts. And, and I know like in some cases, um, companies sort of put on a face for journalists, but this wasn't that like, the head, their head of drivetrain development, the guy who has the patents for the four wheel, the, the four motor four wheel drive system, he looked at me across the campfire and was like, David, I'm like, hello. He's like, dude, I know you. You and I met at an off road rally in northern Michigan at a big party in the woods. And that's the dude who developed their four wheel drive system. I mean, the dude's legit. The guy loved off roading, he knows his stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that was the impression I got from that company. A lot of mechanics on their engineering team. It was great. That's fantastic. Yeah, I agree. That's really rare. Um, the one that I always look for is the one or two PR people who are always there but never have any apparent job to do. Um, I don't know if you if <laughs> it's spot them. Yeah, it, it, there's always one or two. You, what What are you here for? But they're always around there, and all they ever seem to do is drink coffee. Um, but yeah, to have engineers, that would be my dream. Okay. All right. Look, I'm not going to share my screen now. Can you say that? I can see. Yes, I can. Great. great okay, great. cool. So I just want to go over the specs here. Now, I did this as part of the Emmy Hall interview, um, but um, we can talk about a few things here. So the uh, first one is the length. Um, it's 5.5 metres long, which makes it a little bit bigger than, than our Ford Ranger, which is kind of our standard um, ute over mm -hmm. here, which what, what you call a pickup. Um, wheelbase is quite long, actually, 3.4 metres, um, which is longer. Again, I'm using the Ford Ranger here, which is 3.2 metres, so fairly long wheelbase. We're going to get into geometry later on. You talked about off-road geometry, and I, and I agree with you on that. Um, this is the exciting thing. Individual wheel drive, four electric motors. We're going to talk about that. Um, Waiting depth is 1,000 millimetres, and I think that's actually class leading. The, the closest, I think, is the Range Rover, I think, um, which is 900, or maybe that's 1,000, I can't remember. Um, uh, tires, 34.1 inches. Um, inches have gone for 20, so um, 0.3 uh, seconds. 800 kilogram payload. If any of these specs seem wrong, um, just, just let me know. And I think it can tow five tons or 11,000 um, pounds and adjustable height air suspension. Um, oh, and the battery, uh, there's two, three batteries, 105, 135, 180 uh, kilowatt hours. So is those, those specs seem about right to you from what you were saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the things that stand out is it's a short bed, but also short overhangs and huge tires and air suspension that will jack your ride up, height up and yeah. Okay, cool. So um, let's talk about um, a comment you made in your in, in your review then, and you said that you didn't feel that the Rivian was in any way a compromise to an ICE, internal combustion engine, petrol slash diesel. Um, well, what made you I say that? Say, I didn't quite say that. Oh. I, um, I, I did mention compromise in terms of, of towing range and infrastructural issues. And, yeah. um, but what I, was, what, I, what I said there is, if you're an enthusiast, you will love this truck. You know, there are okay. certain things that, that enthusiasts look for in a vehicle. Kind of my main point uh, entering that article is we talk about like enthusiast car, uh, sports cars. We talk about things like manual transmissions and amazing sound and handling. I think with pickup trucks, at least in the U.S., what enthusiasts look for is a little bit different in a, 
than, than sports car enthusiasts. So truck enthusiasts, are, they don't care as much about sound. I mean, look at the, the current crop of mid-sized trucks. They have little V6s and boosted four cylinders that don't sound like anything. Automatic yeah. transmissions that, so yeah, I guess my main point was an enthusiast could and probably would like this truck. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I mean, for me, in a sport, when I'm driving a sports car, um, sound is a big part of it. Styling is a big part of it. For and four-wheel drive, I styling is okay, but it's got. To, I can't have styling which gets in the way of function. Um, don't give me this really curvy back because that compromises my load space. That's the sort of um, thing. That I, and noise. I'd rather you put some effort into durability than making it sound good. It's it's really not that important. Yeah. So, yeah, I tend to agree. All right. Now, um, let's talk a bit about individual wheel drive then. So just so everyone's clear, the Rivian has a motor for each wheel, four separate motors, and it has no differential because it doesn't actually need one. So when it goes around a corner, what a differential would normally do is allow the inside wheel to spin slower than the outside wheel. And there's those, you know, you've got your cogs in, inside the differential, which permits that. Um, with the Rivian, there's just software which detects it, your your rate as you go around the corner and then sends the appropriate amount of torque um, to the left or the right, which actually helps it's it's proper torque vectoring and of course you don't need um brake traction control where you uh well you actually kind of do need brake traction control um but it works differently because you can just meter out exactly the right amount of torque to exactly the wheel that needs it under software control and that is absolutely game changing in my view compared to differentials with brake traction control lsds and, and lockers so david um what are your comments on that um do you agree it's game changing or is it just not really that important what, what's your feeling and how did you feel about driving it um i think it could be game changing in certain conditions definitely i think higher speed conditions rally uh, sort of dune conditions it could be game changing um that wasn't really a part of our of our test drive. We we did drive on road quickly and and it handled very well. I don't know how much torque vectoring was contributing to sort of rotating the car around turns, but you know, in certain conditions, I don't necessarily think it's game changing, and it may actually be a bit of a detriment. Mm -hmm. um, maybe detriment's a little strong. I mean, it's a it's a great system, and and you can tune it to be really good in in almost all conditions. I'll say that going into this test drive, you know, my, my initial thought was this thing's going to be a beast off-road. You know, it's going to be, it's got a motor for each wheel. The, the granularity of its, mm. uh, of that wheel speed and, and, and load is going to be like nothing we've ever seen. And it should be able to really um, just optimize under pretty much all conditions. But what I realized is that in, in rock crawling situations, uh, trying to get an individual wheel how do you refer to it? Individual wheel drive? Is that what you refer to it yeah, as? Yeah, IWD, individual. IWD. That's, a, that's a term I've just come up with. And, I know, let's uh, stick with it. Yeah, and the colloid to that is CWD, which is conventional wheel drive. All right, cool. Well, I'll, I'll say it, IWD in rock crawling uh, scenarios, it, you know, making it behave properly is a, a complex matter. It is not mm -hmm. as simple as one might think. Okay, let's try to mimic a locking differential, which is something that you'd want because yeah, any amount of wheel slip off-road in really technical rock crawling scenarios can be devastating. I mean, it can, yeah. you know, there are some situations where you're kind of on a, you know, on a precipice, you're kind of like, you might be rocking over some cliffs and ledges and you can't have wheel slip yaw your vehicle. Um, so, so the thought, you know, Locking differentials have traditionally been awesome, you know, in, in, in rock crawling situations. And to mimic one with an IWD setup is, it's not trivial. I mean, you've basically got to understand what all the other wheels are doing. Um, and you, you know, you might think, okay, well, we can just mimic it by making sure that all the wheel speeds are the same. But how do you do that if you've got varying traction conditions on each tire? So you've got one with great traction and one without, you have to send different currents to them to keep their uh, angular angular velocity is the same but the thing is that those track conditions are changing all the time and quickly and the vehicle speed is also it's hard you have to get, what is the vehicle speed it's not obvious because you've got slip on different different wheels and so it's um it, it, it's tricky to really get that that 
that's set up working like a locker. And what you'll find, what I found, at least on the, these early R1T vehicles, is that they have to flare up. They have to spin to really understand what the traction conditions are at each wheel. And they use that information to adjust current to the motor. The problem is you don't even want a quarter turn of spin when you're rock crawling. You, you really don't. Um, and, and, you know, with a conventional locker, you really, you have all these, you've got the other three, you've got one spinning, you know, one tractionless wheel. You've got the other three tires that can make up for the lack of traction in a really smooth way, right? With a locker, if you lose grip on one tire, it's not going to spin up. You've got, yeah. as long as you have grip on the other three, even if you, if you have enough grip on one of them, it'll keep it moving smoothly. So that's kind of the tricky thing with this individual wheel drive setup. Yeah, okay. So that's specific to rock um, crawling then. But um, that, let me let me put this to you. So you're going up in your IWD vehicle and um, let's say your front right wheel loses traction. Um, mm -hmm. And in a slow reacting system, um, and let's say of open diffs or an IWD system, um, then you've actually then that wheel has exceeded its grip limit. So there's more torque being provided to it than the traction can handle. So then it slightly spins. Now that's not necessarily the end of the world if it slightly spins. Um, yeah. Um, provided um, you can quickly and smoothly transition torque over to the other wheels totally. uh, yeah, yeah. With, with, without a loss of momentum. Um, and I think that's the difficulty which, which you're talking about there. And But then I go back into the early 90s when the very first brake traction control systems were coming out. I'm talking, you know, Land Rover, um, Defender, TD5, Freelander, One, that, 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 those sort of cars, right? Um, the traction control on those things was really basic, really basic. And we come to 2021 now, and I've just driven the 300 series Land Cruiser. That's amazing with its traction control. And I, I've actually did a tech interview with, with, with two engineers, and, you know, they were talking about um, just how much their wheel speed sensor rates have increased um, over 100 hertz now, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and it's so much better. And I kind of feel that this is the first IWD ever. We've got to give it a chance, you know. It can get a lot better. Locking differentials cannot get better. That you either lock or unlock. There, there is no <laughs> better right. with, with them. Right? <laughs> That's um, right. So I kind of feel that in the future, and I'm interested to know if we can do this or not. Can they do anything proactive? For example, if a wheel is going to spin, typically off road, that happens when you get a reduction of weight because you know the vehicle slightly cross accurate. So can they sense that and go, okay, we reduce weight is reducing on this wheel. We're going to reduce the torque appropriately. Yeah, it's possible. One thing, if I could go back and rewrite my story, I would might I might add a note. You know, we know that there are great traction control systems out there, clutch based systems. Yeah, excellent ones. Brake based, clutch based. There's no reason why Rivian's system can't be as good or better than any of these. Hmm. Um, so that's, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I do think in many ways um, what I experienced, you know, yet, like you said, lockers are, you know, I, you know, I think in certain scenarios, it's hard to be, be as, as good as a, a lock, you know, good as a locker in certain scenarios, but like there's tunability here to make this better. Some off-road vehicles, I'm talking radio controlled ones here, actually overspeed the, the front axle slightly. Um, oh, yeah. Not, not, not road-going ones. Now, in an EV with IWD, you could actually do that by software very easily, but that's very difficult to do mechanically because you don't want that on road. You want all four wheels rotating at the same speed on road. But off-road, there's definitely a case to uh, overspeed. And in fact, interesting, radio controlled Drift cars actually um, have a uh, diff ratio so that the rear turns quicker than the front, um, which allows them, them to be permanently drifting, um, whereas it's the reverse for, for off-road vehicles. Yeah, you can do that, those sort of tricks with IWD, and you can do tank turns and skid steer. So for me, I think IWD beats conventional differentials, but I accept your point that in some situations at the moment, it, it wouldn't be as good. Yeah, I mean... Um being able to really physically lock your wheels together is the ultimate way to, you know, in, in, in certain scenarios is kind of ideal. And um, IWD, 
yeah, you know, if, if there's not a physical lock, you're, there's going to be a transient response time. So, um, you know, even compared to today's traction control systems, I just said that IWD will always be as, should be able to be as good as today's traction control system. Well, you know, it, you can't lock the, the wheels together. So that's, that's yeah. kind of the limitation. But honestly, in so many other scenarios, um, you know, where you're, if we're not talking technical rock crawling, <clears throat> which by the way is not, most people are not doing hot, you know, technical rock crawling. Yeah. Um, it should be, it, it should be better in, in, in so many other scenarios. I, I want to make it clear, like this, this system is not a detriment overall. Right. All right. Like this is a very specific right. area that we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And I would say that IWD would probably beat brake traction control and certainly LSDs um, in that, in that specific scenario. So, yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about range and endurance because one of the big things about about EVs is range. Now, I'm at the point I'm telling people, look, if you're just driving around town, around your city, suburbs, range is not a problem anymore. You go home, you charge the car, it's ready. You just you just don't worry about range, not an issue. But the sort of people that read your articles and follow me are not going to be spending their lives driving around town. They're going to be towing. They're going to be going off road, doing other things. Then, you know. Um, when I've been playing with radio controlled rock crawlers, I've noticed that the battery lasts a really long time when I'm doing technical rock crawling stuff. But if I'm just hooning around um, at high speed, it doesn't last so long. So I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe instead of um, pure range, we should be talking about endurance if you're going to go into really deep, um, low range stuff. But I'm interested to know how far you traveled over what sort of terrain you traveled and what sort of battery life you used to do that. Yeah, we were ascending the, you know, mountains, you know, mountainous uh, um, kind of rocky trails. We did that for, you know, and I wish I had paid a little more attention to the, to the tr uh, distance traveled. It was for probably two or three hours off road on, you know, rocky mountain trails. Um, a lot of elevation change. Um, and then we did some off on road driving. Um, we started the day with 200 miles of range and ended with roughly a hundred, if I recall correctly, none of this is really that helpful. I wish I had paid more attention to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, off road range is something that I sort of discuss in, in the story. It, it is so contingent upon exactly what you're, yeah. what you're doing. Like, you know, I just talked about ele elevation change. It's all a big energy balance. You know, if you're, Elevation change is a big, big deal. You know, that, that change in, you know, the, the mass of your vehicle times gravity times the height of that elevation change as the energy you're using. Um, and like, you know, you know, people might think, okay, well, rock crawling is necessarily going to drain your battery completely. I mean, not necessarily. It depends if it's, a, you know, if it's, if you're not, it's not a huge elevation change and it, it's, the severity isn't that high. How much load is on your whole system? Um, it's all just an, you know, an energy balance. How much energy are you using to go from A to B? And it totally depends. I mean, high, high vehicle speeds, drag, of course, is a big factor. Yeah. Um, if you're towing, it's a huge deal, payload, et cetera. Um, but off-roading itself doesn't necessarily have to be a huge, yeah. uh, uh, you know, compromise in terms of, of, of range, really. Depends, really. Yeah, look, my kind of feeling is that for rock crawling, I expect EVs to do really well because a lot of it is very slow and you stopped. And when you stop, the EV is not really using any energy, whereas an ice is using energy. Um, and, you know, EVs are just really good at that very slow speed stuff. Whereas with an ice, right. the engine's got to spin up to 1,500, 2,000 revs. It's got to go for a torque converter. It's got to do all of these things, just wasting energy. And the ice just goes, kuk, 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 and, it, and, it, and it's over. I it's done. Absolutely. You know, it's really satisfying, especially in this Rivian. You're going downhill. Yeah. And you just, and instead of, and you know that it's the hill descent, hill descent control isn't your brakes just grabbing for dear life, right? Yeah. yeah. It's regen. You, you're going downhill and you're going slowly because your potential energy is being turned into juice for your battery. The regen yes. is the hill descent control is the regen, which is extremely satisfying. Okay. So when you were going down a steep hill, does it purely retard itself off um, regen or does it use the brakes at all? And we're talking really steep here. Uh, oh, we didn't. I don't know that we got to that steep of an obstacle where regen wasn't enough. Okay. Um, regen will really, it, it'll, it'll slow that thing down really well. I want to, I want to make note of another thing you just mentioned. 
you can go incredibly slowly in this vehicle. You know, a lot but of it doesn't have low of, range, does it? No, it does not. No. Um, but it can go so slowly. You know, yeah. Toyota, of course, has has their crawl control, and Ford yeah. has kind of the equivalent trail control. I, I I don't know what you think about these off road cruise control systems. I think they're great. Yeah, I don't use them because I'm an enthusiast, but I can appreciate that they're well executed and very useful. Um, being, you know, because I think one of the tricky things is getting to an obstacle and modulating the throttle uh, um, or accelerator pedal in a way that gets you over at exactly the speed you want. It's not always easy, especially if it's a boosted engine. I found that turbo diesels can be kind of hard to modulate um, well over an obstacle, yep, yep, um, yep. Keep speed down. But if you've got the system doing it for you, you don't have to touch anything. It will adjust the output so that you crawl at whatever speed you want. And I think, you know, I think um, Toyota and Ford, you can do it in increments of maybe a mile an hour or so. I think yeah. Rivian could do it. I, I bet you Rivian could do it in increments of like a third of a mile an hour. Well, you know, um, what? And, and this comes back to my point about radio controlled rock crawlers, because, you know, I was using, I've got a Traxxas TRX4, which I love because it's got high low range and it's got locking differentials front and rear so i can play with that and it, it's really cool um and it i was really impressed at just how precisely you can meter the torque out just just literally just th just that much and exactly. you cannot do that with a nice vehicle you can absolutely do not yeah um and i think w when when i review an off-road vehicle Throttle, throttle responsiveness and how it puts out that sort of power to the ground is a big part of my review because I think that tends to get lost a little bit. That makes a big difference in drivability. Um, so I'm interested to see you, uh, you, you say that. Did I do any form of throttle remapping for throttle? What? Do we even call it a throttle in an EV? Pedal. Just call it pedal. Just call it pedal. You, I mean, uh, throttle is actually, it's not a bad word because it just means like metering essentially. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I generally don't use it when I'm talking about EVs. I just say pedal, yeah. accelerator pedal. They yeah. do. The sensitivity of the pedal changes depending on, on your drive mode. And there's an off-road drive mode. One thing I mentioned in my story is that I had a little bit of difficulty understanding the relationship between motor output and my, ped my pedal position. You know, when you're right. driving it. Yeah, I see yeah. car. You can really feel the drivetrain load up, especially if it's yeah, an automatic. Yeah. You can see, you can feel when you're kind of on that, the edge of when your torque converter output is going to actually move your vehicle forward. You can just, yeah, yeah it's a vibrations. It's a sound. It's kind of that. You can feel it tighten in the drivetrain. With the EV, none of that's there. It, it's literally, you just get to the point. Okay. I guess I'm moving now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I don't know if that, you know, if, if, if perhaps an audio signal will, would help, you know, to, to you understand, okay, we're about to get to the point. I don't actually don't know if that would, that, that would help at all. In any case, it's also possible I would just get used to it, but yeah, I would press the throttle, the, the pedal and I would say, okay, wait, are we moving yet? Uh, okay. I guess we're moving now. And it wasn't as like intuitive to me when we were going to start moving. But yeah. Okay. One thing, one thing that might help with that. I haven't driven a pure EV off-road. But what I have done is driven a Range Rover Sport off-road, which was a PHEV in electric mode only. And what I found with that was I could actually hear the tyres working on the ground, and I've never heard that before in an off-road vehicle. And it is awesome. I, I mean, yeah. if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you, you know, you I spent my whole life off-roading and, and listening to the, the engine and the cooling fan were just a part of the experience, yeah. right? You're outside yeah. in a beautiful setting. And yeah, there's might be a beautiful, you know, a great waterfall and birds chirping, but there's a cooling fan in the background mm -hmm. at all times, right? That's just the way it goes. But with an EV that's gone and it's purely silent. And when you're out in nature, that's just a beautiful thing. I have to say. No, I, I agree with you. Um, I love the sound of a V8 or a V6 supercharger. That's cool. I just don't want it in nature. I'd much rather creep along quietly and just yeah. absorb things. But also, if you start listening to the wheels and the tires, to me, that's like traction control for your brain because then you start to hear what's happening there. It's a bit like when you're driving a sports car at high speed on a track. You, you know, you kind of get tuned into the tires and everything else there, and you really start to hear them. Um, and if in an EV four-wheel drive, I started to hear, hear that. And I think maybe pipe that noise in, into, the, into, the, into the cabin a little bit. That could help. 
But what if you're not moving yet? Like, let's just say you've got good, good grip. Hmm. And you're going over a big rock and you're, you know, you, normally in an IC, you would build, you know, your revs would build, the load would build to a point where you've got enough torque to get over top. So hmm. in an EV, like for me, the tricky part is when am I going to actually start moving? The tire, there's no tire noise okay. yet. All right. Yeah. Good point. I like it. Um, I'm going to go to electric winching for this because when you're winching, one of the things I, I, I teach winching is to say, listen to the winch motor because when the, the winch motor will tell you to a reasonable degree how much strain it's under. So if all you've got to do is take those electric motors and amplify their noise and sort of have this scale so you can kind of listen to the torque, listen to the torque output for each motor in stereo. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honestly like the, the, the motors are experiencing more and more torque as you give it more pedal. And yeah. so let's hear it. That, yeah. Perhaps I'd be very interested in seeing how helpful such an audio signal would be to an off-roader. Well, you know what? And yeah, that's what I'd like. So, so four, four speakers, front, left and, and rear, and you have audio from each of the motors coming through. Or you could even take a feed and actually put it into sensors in, in, the, um, in the driver's seat. So you can actually feel what each one is doing. Yeah, I mean, it's all, yeah, I, I think it's this whole, you know, driving EVs off-road is it's exciting because I think maybe in 10 years we'll say, you know, uh, we, we adapted the way, that, you know, the way that we off-road. We look for different things now and we're able to, you know, I bet you in a few years, we'll just, we'll just have adapted the things that we're looking for and we'll, we'll kind of become a lot more, um, uh, um, just a lot more we'll just we'll, we'll be able to to pilot these machines in a, in a way that maybe now isn't quite intuitive because of our kind of preconceived ice based notions you know well look that, i think that's right it's a bit like going from a suzuki Jimny to a dodge ram you know got to recalibrate what's possible and what's not because they're two completely different vehicles or a vehicle with if you suddenly put lockers in it all of a sudden you've got capabilities you we drive a trailer. So with EVs, it's just a question of learning the vehicle, what it can and cannot do. So yeah, I agree. So that's the end of part one. In part two, we're going to cover off-road geometry and EVs, independent versus live suspension, different types of EV, weight, suspension, the future of 4x4s, including hydrogen, who'd buy a Rivian, brand loyalty in countries, and more.